Hi, I'm Mara Bachalaki and I'm the Community Development Agent at the Cooperative Extension Service at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. We're standing in my backyard on March 1st amongst this big pile of snow and we're here to take a look at my chicken coop, um, the chicken hen house and some of the chickens inside so that I can talk a little bit about what goes into keeping a laying flock through the winter in Alaska. Um, in addition to going through the parts of what you'll need to have a home laying flock, I'm also going to talk a little bit about the costs and benefits of keeping laying hens in Alaska uh, through the winter. Now let's take a closer look, look at the coop. Um, as you notice, there's fencing, and I have this because I don't want to have uh, wild animals take my chickens. Chickens really do like to be free range, but unfortunately, many things like to eat chickens. It's not just humans. And so when you have a, a laying flock and you've spent a lot of money on raising up those chickens and feeding them and they're now producing eggs, you probably don't want to lose them to predators. And among the list of things that like to get chickens um, in Alaska are fox, dogs, ravens, owls, hawks, um, just about anything that eats meat would like to have a chicken. So in addition to having a fence, I also have netted my coop um, with chicken wire. This also has the added protection of um, not allowing the chickens to fly out. Most people don't realize that chickens can fly, but actually they're quite good flyers. And at times before I had my coop netted, I actually had chickens roosting up in my trees here. So. Um, this is the coop, and I also wanted to point out that all of the material that this is built from is all recycled and, and salvaged. Um, this gate, actually, in its entirety, I got out of the dump. It was already cut like this with the, with the um, uh, wire. Um, all of the wire fencing is recycled, and I think the only thing that is actually was purchased was a couple of these all-weather posts. Um, even the building itself, we built from salvaged plywood and windows and such like. So you can really build a very nice uh, enclosure and home for your chickens without spending a lot of money. So let's go inside and take a closer look. Let's look at the uh, coop in a little bit uh, closer detail to see some of the essential features that one needs when you're building a coop. Again, as I pointed out, all of this is recycled uh, plywood and material that we salvaged from the dump. If you're in a village um, and looking at building a coop, you might not have as much access to recyclable stuff, but really you don't need to have uh, much. And my first coop was actually a wooden packing crate. Um, it fit seven birds very easily, and um, I even had a window in it. So this is a little bit more upscale, but again, I didn't spend any money on anything except for the paint to paint it. You'll need to have a full-size door so you can go in and out to uh, clean the coop and of course to take care of the chickens. This is a pretty narrow door and if you were building a larger coop I would recommend building a, a wider door because I find it sometimes hard to shovel in and out the litter and things like that. Um, I didn't talk about the size of the coop but depending on how many birds you want to have um, that will determine the, the, how large you make your building and of course the larger it is the harder it is to heat. So that's something to take uh, into consideration. This coop houses a dozen chickens very comfortably, and I probably could fit in 14, but since they have to stay in all winter long from about October through mid-March, I don't like to overcrowd them too much. So I have a door, step is a nice feature. Um, what's really important is to have a vent. Um, chickens have to have some fresh air. If they have um, no air circulation, sometimes the ammonia from their uh, droppings uh, combined with the litter can build up to kind of toxic values. So uh, it's important for chickens to have a vent and also to get a little fresh air. It does let in cold air and of course it lets out all the warm air as you can see from all the frost, but you can't uh, not have your, your building ventilated. Over here, um, we have, this is actually how chickens go in and out. There's a very small door here, and in the summer and warmer months I have it open, and this is how they go in and out. Uh, they need to have a ramp. Chickens can't really jump up too well, and they like to walk up ramps. Uh, make sure that your ramp has little um, steps like this so that helps them 
uh, maintain their balance getting up and down. I have a, um, a roof here because one of the important things about chickens that you can't see because of all the snow is that they really like to dust. Um, so right here in the summer, they have a, a dust pit and I keep this here so that it keeps it dry for them. And that's also the purpose of this other roof that I have over here. There's another dust pit there. Um, chickens dust because they need to keep the, that's the way that they keep the bugs and mites out of their feathers. It's part of their keeping themselves healthy and clean. And so they do, they will need to have a dry area um, during the summer months to dust. If, obviously in the winter, they don't do much dusting at all. Here I have a window and a coop, is, it's good to always have a window so that they get some natural daylight. Um, light is very important in their egg laying cycle, which I'll talk about a little bit more when we're inside the coop. Um, this window I also salvaged from the dump. It doesn't have to be fancy and it certainly doesn't need to open. Um, and here you have the electrical system of this particular coop. Every coop will need to have a power because you're going to have to have um, a regular lamp for daylight to increase daylight hours when it's dark in the winter and most importantly you need electricity to keep their water thawed and a heat lamp for the very cold days. Um, the best way to do it is of course to hardwire a coop and actually install wiring to it but um, I have done it with an extension cord which has worked fine for nine to ten years and I've never had any trouble with it. So there is the coop's power supply. Let's uh, actually go inside the coop and take a look at the chickens and the setup inside it. Um, before we go in, I'll point out another design flaw. These are things to think about before you build them. Um, but I, I have to add these pieces of wood in the winter because I add litter. I, I use a deep litter method, which is basically piling up straw, um, not cleaning out the coop on a regular basis, but putting up a thick layer of straw on the floor so that it helps insulate the coop. And when we designed this, we didn't think about that. So without having um, extra space or a lip, all of the litter f comes out and it gets stuck in the door and then it doesn't shut properly. Also, although actually I didn't really want to have a permanent lip because in the summer it's a lot easier to clean it out and muck it out without having that. With the deep litter, you, what you want to do is you have a pitchfork or some implement like that, and then just regularly you actually fluff up the straw and stuff, and then that causes the droppings to drop to the bottom of the coop. Of course, cleaning it out in, usually I clean the coop in about April, it's quite the mess, but um, it does keep the birds warm and it saves on energy. So this is my Jerry Riggs solution to keeping the litter inside. It involves some acrobats getting in and out of the coop. But here we are inside, and I have currently now 11 chickens. I have 10 hens and a rooster. Um, it's not essential to have a rooster with your flock. Um, I have them because I like the way he crows, and also he does offer protection to the birds, and generally, it makes for a happier flock to have um, a rooster because that's what they're used to. Um, you don't want to have two roosters. I did once have two roosters and they fought quite a bit. And look, somebody's laid an egg here. Um, so in a coop, your essential things that you have to have are nest boxes. Um, the hens really do want to uh, lay their eggs in an enclosed area like this. If you don't have nest boxes, they'll tend to lay them all over um, on the ground and stuff, and those will freeze in the winter. You also want to have your nest box elevated because, of course, the higher up you go in the coop, the warmer it is. Down around floor level, it's probably about, right now, 10 degrees, but up here it's about 30. And if you have your nest box too low, your eggs will freeze before they collect them. You'll want to check for your eggs every day. Um, let's see, I also have a perch. Um, chickens like to sleep by roosting, so this is essential to have. They really don't like to rest with their feet flat, but I do have a flat shelf here for them to give them some extra places to go. Since spending about five or six months in here at a time gets a little bit tight for them. Again, you'll see I have a ramp here. Um, I put this in after 
uh, a couple years ago because I had elderly chickens and they found it hard to fly up into the coop or in, sorry into the nest boxes but they like to have ramps I don't really quite understand that about chickens but they definitely prefer to have ramps I of course have their feed here um, I put something on top because chickens like to sit on everything and they poop everywhere so I put something over the feed to prevent them from pooping in it and that's the same thing here this is the, their water and it has to be on a heater um, you can buy these commercially but it keeps the water thawed and it has a thermos it's thermostatically controlled so if it's not um, cold enough to really have this on it will turn itself off I have this hanging bucket here again to prevent them from sitting on top of the water and pooping in it chickens are not house trained there needs to be a regular lamp um, I put this on a timer and in the winter I make sure they have 12 hours of actual uh, light on because they will not lay eggs in the winter if they don't have daylight. So I fake the daylight for them. Much like humans and seasonal affective disorder, they need to have light. This is the window that we looked at outside. In the winter, it totally frosts up. Um, so they, but they still get a little bit of light. And I put netting on it again because they like to sit on stuff and poop all over. The other thing that I have is a heat lamp. Um, this is critical to have and it costs quite a lot of electricity. Um, it's a regular red bulb that burns at 250 watts. You have to get a, um, an actual heat lamp special light fixture um, because if you use a regular like shop light, you will, you will melt it. So get a, an approved one from your feed store. And I also have a thermometer so that I can um, gauge what the temperature is inside the coop. Generally, I find in a coop of this size with uh, this many birds that I only have to turn on the heat lamp when it's about five below and colder. Um, when you have a really cold winter, it's, almost, it's on almost all of the time, and it can really increase your electric bill by quite a bit. Um, this past January here in Fairbanks, where electricity is quite a bit cheaper than in the villages, my electric bill jumped by 25 to $30, um, keeping this coop warm for them. So that's something you want to factor into when you think about having chickens. Um, I all, well, I pointed out I have a timer. I have Christmas lights in here. People might wonder why I have Christmas lights in the coop, and that's because when it gets dark, um, when the light goes off, chickens will just roost wherever they are when the light when it, the light goes off and becomes very dark. And if they're down on the floor, that's too cold for them at night. So I put up in, um, Christmas lights, and these are LEDs so that they're low energy, so that there's enough little bit of light that if the, when the main light goes off at night and chickens happen to be down on the floor, they have enough light to come up and sit on the roost. Um, when it's really cold, all 10 or so chickens will huddle here and stay warm. The things that you want to watch out for on hens or on chickens um, when you're keeping them in the winter is to make sure they're not getting frostbite on their combs or on their feet. Um, and if they get frostbite, it will show as little black spots and things like that on their comb. Generally, um, they're pretty well, they're okay for managing in the cold because they're heavily, they have lots of feathers, but the comb and the feet are the areas that are most sensitive. Um, and this is Sweetie Bird. She's a new hen that I just got. She's just about a, under a year old, and she doesn't like to be home. <laughs> Most chickens don't like to be handled. Um, if you raise them up from chicks and you don't have much hands on with them, they will not like to be held. So. If you're raising chickens and you want to be able to pet them and really handle them, you want to start doing it as a chick. Um, I didn't do that with most of my chickens since, as you can see, they get kind of freaked out by it. Um, I'm not in this session going to talk about raising chickens from little chicks. That's something you're going to have to do if you want to have um, laying hens. And it's, it's pretty labor intensive, so we'll leave that for another session. This is really just about talking about what to do when you have them as adult hens and they're laying. Some people will want to know how long do um, hens lay. Their active years are from about year one to year three, and then after that their egg laying productivity really drops off. Most people who are in the business of having hens specifically for laying will um, kill them after two to three years. I am a soft touch and I keep my hens. 
Um, so I have, out of all of these, I only have four that are actively laying. The rest are retired, as we say. And this particular hen down here, whose name is Lupe, she's nine years old. The average lifespan of a chicken is about seven to uh, obviously nine years. Um, and she's still going strong, but she stopped laying about five years ago. So I have a lot of freeloaders here. Another thing you might notice about my coop is it's really quite odd paint job. It goes without saying that I don't use, um, I don't spend a lot of money getting high-end paint, but I use what paint I have left lying around. I paint it about every two to three years. Um, it helps preserve the plywood and, and interiors from sort of the, the, it gets pretty humid in here in the winter with the chickens, and then of course they kind of, they're messy. You might have noticed this. Um, the coop is not the cleanest place, and chickens poop everywhere, and if you have any sort of concern about working or taking care of animals that are kind of messy, chickens might not be for you. Um, I try to keep the coop as clean as possible, but it's a very small space, and when you have 11 to 12 birds in it for several months at a time, it's just, it is what it is. It's a chicken coop, and they are kind of messy and smelly birds, as anybody who's kept chickens will tell you. Um, you don't have to worry about health issues, though, with your home flock, and that's one good thing about having chickens and one reason why you might want to think about having laying hens. Um, Increasingly in our commercial eggs, as you might have noticed in the news, there's been reports of salmonella in the eggs. Um, my eggs and any egg that you have in a, in a home-raised flock is very healthy because you know your chickens, you know if they're healthy, and you know what you're feeding them. And why, the reason that the you know, commercial products get contaminated is because of the conditions in which chickens are kept. So although my coop is a little bit messy because this is March and it's the end of a long winter, I, they're healthy birds. I watch them all the time for disease and things like that. Um, and I have, of course, this nine-year-old chicken, so I know that they um, live long lives and they wouldn't be doing that if they had diseases. Um, the other thing about a coop, too, is that it gets very dusty. That comes from the, the litter that you use, and also, as I mentioned earlier, chickens really like to dust their feathers to keep their mites down, and that's how they groom themselves. So if you're a person with allergies or asthma, you definitely do not want to keep chickens. Um, it just is very dusty, and it's hard to avoid that. When I clean out the coop, I do wear a dust mask. That helps, but um, people who are sensitive to, to dust and allergies probably should rethink having a home laying flock or get somebody else to take care of the chickens for you. Um, another important aspect to keeping chickens is what kind of bedding or litter, as we call it in the vernacular, that they use. Um, this is important for a couple of reasons. One here in Alaska particularly is the insulation that it gives and the warmth. And the other is that chickens won't lay unless they have something in their, their nest box. They like to, they like to nest, they're birds. Um, here I'm using straw, and it's not my preferred choice. Usually I use wood shavings that I get at the local lumber, lumber yard, but they were out um, for the winter because they all went to make wood pellets. So I was forced to use straw. Um, it's not bad, but I really prefer to have wood shavings in their, in their nest boxes. It's easier to keep clean. Um, straw is kind of messy. It also doesn't break down as easily in my compost pile, or I can't use it as well in my garden as I can a mixture of droppings and wood shavings. Um, and straw is, can be a little bit um, dustier, and you have to be careful. This year I got a couple of bales that were very mildewed and wet and moldy, and it really caused my allergies um, to flare. So, and I didn't think it was particularly healthy for the chickens to have a lot of mold. So that's another thing to consider, and something that you would want to consider if you're out in a remote village and thinking about doing laying hens, because you're going to need to bring in several bales of straw to get them through the winter, unless there's some local uh, grasses or something that you can pick, but you're going to have to pick it in pretty large quantities. Um, this is about three to four bales that I use in a winter, so something to keep in mind when you're thinking about doing chickens remotely. Another thing that we should talk about is what you feed your chickens. Um, in the summer, I often feed my chickens uh, weeds that I take out of the garden. They have bugs, of course. They have access to bugs. They really uh, prefer to eat bugs. They're, they are mostly meat eaters, uh, another little known fact about chickens. Um, and bugs and worms of that 
that nature are the things that they would prefer to eat, but of course they're in short supply up here. Um, but they do love weeds and also things uh, like fireweed and bluebells, and I'll, I'll pick that and feed them feed that to them in their coop. However, they also need to have um, regular feed and I t uh, use a commercial uh, layer feed. There's special feed for meat birds, layers, and uh, young uh, chicks. But this is layer feed. It comes in either crumbles or pellets. And I strongly adv uh, advocate for feeding uh, commercial food because it's balanced in all the nutrition, nutrients and, and micronutrients uh, that chickens need. They can have a real a range of really ugly diseases with their hips and joints and feathers because if they don't get the proper sort of nutri um, nutrition. The other thing too that I don't have right now in here is um, calcium. I take their eggs and I chop them up really fine so that they don't look like an egg and I feed back their egg shells to them because obviously they need to have extra calcium to have hard shells. Um, you can also get oyster shells and um, use that as a supplement for laying hens. You don't ever want to give them a shell uh, even if you've used the egg in half, you know, like a half egg shell, because if they ever start realizing that they can eat their eggs, they will. So uh, you want to prevent them from, from making a connection between that their egg is good to eat and the source of calcium. So I just pulverize the egg shell so it doesn't look like an egg. <laughs> ah, yes, this is quite the trick. It keeps me limber in the winter getting over that silly little thing, but it works. Okay, the other type of food that I give them, which can't be their um, primary food, but I use as a supplement because they really like it, is called chicken scratch. And it's a mixture of, in this case, cracked corn and it looks like, I think it's wheat grains. Um, this is something that they really love to eat. Uh, it can't be their primary source of food because it doesn't have all of the balance of vitamins and nutrients that they need but as a treat you can't beat it and they get very excited so I'm going to give them a can of scratch now and I do this daily for them because they like to eat it and I just throw it on the bottom of the coop floor and then they go wild over it. Okay now I'm going to close it up because they're getting a little bit chilly. It is about minus 15 out here today even though it's March, but yes, it's still cold. So you've now gotten um, somewhat of an overview of what a coop looks like for keeping chickens in the winter in interior Alaska, or probably for that matter, anywhere in Alaska. So it can be done. As you can see, the chickens can be kept quite healthy. Um, they could maybe get a little cabin fever like we all do throughout the long winter, but it really doesn't affect them even though they are temperate birds and are not obviously indigenous to this state. However, so the question really isn't can you keep winter, you know, chickens through the winter, it is, is it cost effective or is it something that you can afford to do because the cost of doing so can be quite high. Um, it is undoubtedly cheaper to buy your eggs at Fred Meyers, but uh, when you do your home flock, you get a quality product. Um, fresh eggs are unbeatable. They're just, the yolk is really golden, they're firm, they taste better. But it's quite expensive to do here in the north. And I'm here in Fairbanks, and as I mentioned earlier, my electric bill, I notice at least 20 to $30 more in the months of December and January. And so in a remote rural village, that cost is going to be even higher. Um, also, if you're thinking about doing chickens and you don't live on the road system, you're going to have to either fly in or barge in several bags of commercial food. Um, my chickens, for this size flock, I buy a bag of feed about every two months. So you could figure that for a year you would need to um, barge in about uh, six to eight bags, plus then also the scratch. Um, they go through that a lot faster. So I'm going to say maybe a dozen bags, and those are 50 pound bags. The straw, the um, uh, bales of straw, those are sort of the annual things that you would need every year. Um, there's the cost of getting the chicks to you and of raising the chicks because stores don't sell um, chickens, they sell chicks. And that requires a whole other setup of incubator and ways to keep the chicks um, healthy and warm until they 
actually get their full feathers. There's, um, of all the things, actually getting the coop and the pen is probably the, the lowest uh, dollar cost because you can, as you can see, build a pretty nice coop with um, scavenged materials. So of course there's your time and, and labor, but um, that's not actually, that's sort of your upfront cost. I think that the, the larger, you know, things to figure in is that annual cost of the electricity to keep the animals warm. Um, if you make a decision to keep laying chickens, you're going to want to make it a humane situation for them and you don't want to have them freeze or um, have really severe frostbite. The other thing that I found out um, yesterday, for instance, is because my coop is on an extension cord, we had a little bit of an accident with my water truck and he broke the extension cord and I came home about five or six hours later to a very cold coop. Um, I was able to drive back to town and get an accord, but if you're out in the uh, remote area, you don't have that option. So you would want to have extra backup of your water heater. Um, the chickens actually drink quite a lot of water, and so it's imperative that they have thawed water. If uh, their water freezes, they'll usually dehydrate quite quickly. You have to have backup heat lamps in case your heat lamp broke. Mine actually broke this morning. So again, I'm going to be going to town soon to get one, but I have that ability to go into town and get a replacement. You're going to also need to have backup heat lamp bulbs. Um, and so things of that nature, you also are going to be buying um, your feeders and your water, um, water, chicken waterers. So I'm going to guess that, you know, your initial outlay to set up a coop is going to be about a thousand dollars. And then beyond that, you've got your annual expenses of the electricity. Okay. A couple of other things I forgot to mention. Um, one is about raising your own um, chickens. Um, I know I talked about bringing in chicks, and of course you're going to have to do that when you first start a flock. But, uh, you know, back in the day they didn't have feed stores where you bought your little chicks. You actually had chickens being produced in your own flock. And I do have a rooster. Well, the interesting thing is that as um, genetics have, you know, they've become more uh, using genetics w w in layer flocks um, and commercial egg production, they've sort of bred out the aspect of laying hens being what we call broody. Broody means they want to sit on an egg. And if the hen does not want to sit on the egg, then it's not going to hatch. It's not going to mature. Even if you have a rooster fertilizing it, you need to have the, the hen sit on it, keep it warm, so that it, it develops into a chick. Um, of all the chickens that I have in here, I've, never, I've only had ever one in nine years go broody. And they actually, they, they become in such a way that they want to sit on the nest, they don't want to eat, they don't, they barely get off to drink water, and they actually sit and they, they brood the egg. So it's been an interesting um, aspect of our modern uh, sort of genetic development of chickens is that increasingly chickens are less and less inclined to sit on nests. However, you certainly can do it, and I have, um, I have no people that, that raise up barnyard flocks, that's how they're called, um, where they're having the rooster fertilize the eggs. They leave eggs in the nest box and they entice a hen to sit upon that. Um, sometimes that's done by getting fake eggs or golf balls or something that you, you want to try to trick the hen into thinking that she really wants to sit on the, the nest. But it's not as common as it used to be back in the good old days and so um, it may or may not work for you. Um, I personally gen generally just buy either new young chicks and raise them up or sometimes now that I've had a, um, a flock for uh, quite a period of time, people around Fairbanks know that I keep chickens and I often get year old chickens that they don't want to keep anymore. So that's how I keep adding to my flock and having hens that continue to be young enough to be laying eggs. Um, Another thing that I might mention about egg laying is uh, on average hens lay one egg every, every day for about two to three days and then they'll take a day off. So I never really know which hen is laying and who's still laying. Um, some egg, hens lay different colored eggs. Um, I have a couple in here that lay blue eggs and so those I can tell that they're, they're laying. But generally I'm getting one to two eggs every day um, without fail and so in a week with just this size flock I get about um, a dozen eggs. And so uh, this, this number of hens is perfect for a family of maybe uh, you know 
if you eat a lot of eggs, a family of four, I tend to give away eggs. So um, if you're, depending on whether you want to, to actually start selling eggs, you can adjust the number of hens that you have. And there's quite a lot of uh, good books on small uh, flock production, egg production that you can refer to if you want to know how many hens you should keep in order to sell eggs and then correspondingly how large you're going to need to make your coop because if you want to get into small scale egg production where you're going to be selling your eggs you're probably going to need a larger coop because you're going to need more birds. This is really for a family sized um, consumption of eggs. Okay that just about wraps it up for winter chickens and their coop. Um, there were a couple more things I wanted to point out before we finish for the day and one is that I didn't talk about the insulation but I actually did put insulation in the walls and the ceiling of the coop to help um, contain heat and to cut down on energy costs. Um, it, the only thing is that I had squirrels move into the roof and they prom probably took out most of the insulation but you will want to think about um, doing something like that. I don't advise insulating the floor because you're going to need to um, mop it down or hose it out in the summer and if you you know get water down into the insulation then it pretty much um, eliminates having even gone to the trouble of insulating the floor so but if you can insulate the walls and the roof that's a uh, highly recommend that you do that because that will help keep uh, the coop warm in our cold winter days. The other thing is this nice design flaw that um, I figured out after this was built we put in this nice roof here to provide a dry area right in front of the door and also to keep snow from piling up in front of the door, which has been very nice, um, especially when we get large snow dumps like we recently had. But unfortunately, what we didn't think about was where we placed the gate. And as you can see, the gate is right under this um, snow load that's about to slide off and it would have been better to have placed it further away because what happens is I, I do clean it off and then I have to shovel it all away, which is kind of a lot of work and uh, other times also what will happen is that in the, especially in the spring it starts dripping and it forms this terrible ice dam here and then I can't get the gate open and every morning I have to go and chip it away with my ice chipper and every evening so every time I want to get into the chickens I have to chip open the gate so when you're putting together your coop even if it's very simple as I found out you can run into these little things that um, well they just make life a little bit more difficult but they're not really that insurmountable but kind of plan out and map out the, your layout before you go and build it is my advice. So that's it for today and I hope that this um, demonstration and uh, tour of my chicken coop helped give you a little bit of an idea of what it uh, takes to keep laying chickens through the winter in Alaska and gives you some idea of the costs and benefits of keeping a laying flock at home. Here are some of the more common breeds that lay through a long Alaskan winter. Chickens that are large, robust, and heavily feathered are good choices for a winter flock in Alaska. Also, chicken breeds that have small combs and wattles are less likely to get frostbite than chickens with fancy spike combs and long wattles. Most of the heavy breeds lay brown eggs. However, Araucanas, which are sometimes also called Americanas, are a smaller, less robust breed that are extremely popular because they lay colored eggs, pink, green, blue, or brown. If having a home laying flock appeals to you, here are some publications and books on raising and keeping chickens that can help you get started. Here is a list of suppliers for chicks, basic poultry equipment, and various types of chicken feed.